America. At last, the day you've all been waiting for, the day we're going to announce the grand prize winner in the blast-off. Blast-off, as you know, the space food of the astronauts. The blast-off space food jingle contest. Behind me, in this house, is the winner. The winner does not know that he has won the blast-off contest. May I please have the bottle? Thank you, Miss Blastoff. Lovely, lovely. Now, there's an exciting moment. I'm a little nervous. It's been so many months. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner is Mr. Stoney Stevenson, 32 Wilshire Terrace, Indianapolis, Indiana. And now, Mr. Stevenson, here we come. <laughs> Just think, ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments from now, in this typical modest American home, in this modest American community, you will meet the man who has won the grand prize in the blast-off space jingle contest, the energy drink of the astronauts and mission control. We're going to present him with the grand prize of a trip to the chronosynclastic infundibulum. Here it comes now. Oh, yes. excuse me, madam. Oh, excuse no, me. thank you. No, we no, don't no. want any. Oh, oh, oh. Madam, excuse me. You don't understand. May I just speak to you for a moment? We are on network television right now. Oh. Is this the home of Mr. Stoney Stevens? Yes. Well, may we see him, please? We have a very important announcement to make. Stoney! In a few uh, moments, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, someone the here to see you. Live television. The excitement. Here he comes now. Here he comes. Oh. Hello. Hello. Good day to you. Hello. Uh, are you Mr. Stevenson? Yeah, that's right. Stoney Stevenson. Stoney Stevenson? Here he is, America. Stoney Stevenson, congratulations. Pardon me, Mama. We have an important announcement to make to you right now. You are the winner, the grand prize winner in the Blast Off Space Jingle Contest. America, here's your winner, Stoney Stevenson. This is Walter Gesundheit and ex-astronaut Bud Williams, Jr. Bringing you every exciting moment of the flight of Prometheus 5, direct from Mission Control, Space Flight Center. Right. Three months ago, Mr. Stoney Stevenson received the news on nationwide TV that he had won first prize in the space poem competitions. Have a thing. Yes, it is. And since then, he's undergone one of the most concentrated crash courses for astronauts ever devised. And in a very few moments, we will see the results of these endeavors. Prometheus 5, with astronaut Stoney Stevenson aboard, is on the launching pad. And with you, we will wait out the final moments before blastoff. Really is uh, tense here today, Walter. Uh, right, bud. Tense is the word of the hour as astronaut Stoney Stevenson sits high atop the rocket, awaiting his launch into the Kronos and Plastic Infundibulum. Walter, I understand that uh, we have contact with astronaut Stevenson in his capsule now. Why don't we uh, find out just what he's thinking in these last few minutes before blastoff? Well, good thinking, bud. Come in, Stoney Stevenson. Uh, astronaut Stevenson, this is Walter Gesundheit and ex-astronaut Bud Williams. Can you hear us? Can you hear him, Walter? Can't even see him. Uh, sorry, it seems we have some difficulty with the connection to the space capsule. For those of you who just tuned in, the countdown for the launch of Prometheus 5 has been temporarily halted at zero minus 60 seconds. Uh, Bud, you were on uh, Prometheus 1 and Prometheus 3. That's right, I was. Uh, well, what I really wanted to ask was, uh, how did a highly trained technical person like yourself feel when you, uh, when you learned that a man who writes poetry in his spare time was going to make this trip? Well, at first, uh, I thought he'd be too emotional, mm -hmm. Walter. I thought uh, maybe he can give us some fancy descriptions of things, mm -hmm. but uh, if the going really gets tough the way it did on Prometheus 3... Oh, I don't uh, you mean when the tang got loose in the uh, landing module? Oh, there was tang all over the place <laughs> and no gravity. Yes. But I said, uh, you know, I realized they were going to put a man right through a time warp, a chronosynclastic infundibulum. I said, well, maybe only a poet uh, could describe a thing like that. Well, you know, uh, words somehow seem inadequate 
when one is describing space. Yes, well, if you remember, I had a great deal of trouble uh, describing Mars. Well, you said it looked uh, like your driveway back home in Dallas. Yes, well, that's what it did look like to me at the time. So if they were to put me through a time warp... A chronos and clastic infundibulum? Right, I probably would be speechless myself. Uh-huh. You know? uh-huh. I mean, uh, you put a man through a time warp and... A uh, chronos and clastic infundibulum. Yeah, and for a while, he's going to be scattered not only uh, through space, mm. but... Uh, time he's going to be a hundred different places at once and there's no way of guessing just where you know but uh, what kind of training has astronaut stevenson gone through to prepare for this mission well walter he's really trained uh, very hard for the mission you know we have a standard uh, here at mission control a standard of excellence uh that's the atmosphere here at mission control bud excellence it takes a special person one with fortitude ambition Skill, intelligence. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I mean, I couldn't get a glandular reading. I'm very sorry, Ernie. I'm very sorry. Well, that's all right. Do the best you can. Just a minute. I've got a call coming in here. Forthrightness, awareness, good eyesight, Mm -hmm. and most of all, guts to work here in the heart of mission control. I mean, it's here that the very life of astronaut Stevenson is entire life will be watched over and cared for, whereas every heartbeat, respiratory, and digestive activity will be monitored by computer. Excellence is the byword and the product of this crack team here at Mission Control. Well, I understand we've now made contact with Stoney Stevenson uh, high atop his launch rocket. Hello, Stoney. Yes, and uh, a special kind of man it is to be a space adventurer, an explorer of the unknown. A man from mission control is very special indeed. Geologist. Physicist. Electrical engineer. Physician. Chemist. Test pilot. The Air Force. The Army and the Navy. And now, the average man. Stoney Stevenson. One and all, the great team, the men from Mission Control. Before we hear from our astronaut, uh, we're fortunate to have Mrs. Stevenson, Stoney's mother, with us here in the studio. She's been keeping up a constant vigil here at Mission Control. Bud? You must be very proud of your son. It doesn't seem possible. Nobody in our family ever won a contest. Well, I'd like to announce to you and to the American public that Stoney was made an honorary private in the United States Army this morning. Well, isn't that something? Isn't that great? Uncle George won't believe it. When he was a child, did you have any intimation that someday he'd be going off into space like this? He used to be interested in the pressure cooker. He'd get it out and play with it, seal it up tight and then unseal it again put different things in it, marbles, his toy fire engine. Uh Uh-huh. Now they got him all sealed up. I was about to say that uh, he came from a typical American family, but of course he isn't a typical American astronaut, is he? Depends on what kind of typical you're talking about. I I think we're typical Americans. His father committed suicide. I've been married three times, happily only once. To Stoney's father? To Fred K. Bonzer. Stoney uh, did grow up, though, in the American Middle West. Indianapolis. In what we'd consider a typical Hoosier house. The welfare people had us in a Holiday Inn for a while. That was quite a scandal. Why do they call people from Indiana Hoosiers? I've often wondered about that. Nobody knows. Hmm. So, Stoney Stevenson's roots are in Indiana soil. He has a cemetery lot in Brooklyn, New York. Pardon me? Fred K. Bonzer, my third husband, inherited a cemetery lot in Brooklyn from a rich uncle. He gave it to Stoney on Stoney's eighth birthday Uh at a big party at the Holiday Inn. Mm. That was before the newspapers found out that the welfare people had put us up there at 30 bucks a night. Right. And that was just before the hit the fan. You signaling me, Walter? Sorry to interrupt, bud. Let's switch now to Colonel Donald Tax Pirandello, the voice of Prometheus 5. Tex, I know there's been a lot of conversation about uh, will he wear his space suit or won't he? Uh, Do you have the final decision on that? Right, Walter. Uh, Soon after launch, 
he will take off his outer protective envelope or spacesuit and eject it from the capsule. He will not need his spacesuit in his travel. Astronaut Stevenson will drink orange flavored hydrogen peroxide and absorb the slowly released oxygen through the wall of his small intestine. Communications between the capsule and mission control will be established momentarily. In the meantime, I know he would want me to let everybody know how happy and proud he is today. He's raring to go. We are at 60 seconds and counting. Oh, my. Uh, we interrupt this countdown to bring you special coverage of a disturbance at Southgate. Take it away, Sandy. This is Sandy Abernathy at the South Gate of Mission Control. The radical evangelist, Dr. Bobby Denton, and a group of his avid followers are here protesting the launching of Prometheus 5. It's an angry crowd, and the guards cannot hold... Minus 45 seconds. Dr. Denton was just released yesterday from federal prison, where he served a nine-day sentence for disorderly conduct for his actions at the Poor People's March last June. 30 seconds and counting. They have refused to leave. Let's take a listen. These scientists, I say, are just building another Tower of Babel. Well, we don't need them. And we don't need their countdowns to get us where we're going, do we? Because we have our own countdown here on God's Green Spaceship. Do you know what it is? Do you want to hear it? Ten. Ten. Do you covet your neighbor's things? Nine. Nine, do you bear false witness? Eight. Eight, do you steal? Seven, do you commit adultery? Six. Five, do you honor your mother and father? Four. Three, take the name of the Lord in vain. Two. Do you make any favorite images? One. Blast off! Oh, blast off! Blast off. It's a good one. Delta acceleration at maximum. Optimum burnout projected. Cabin systems A-OK. -okay. Communications tracking locked in. Looks good from here. Well... There you have it, the successful launch of Prometheus 5, an historic day as man reaches further into space to find the meaning of life. Traveling at 28,000 miles an hour, Stoney Stevenson is headed for the Kronos and Clastic Infundibulum. And it's in that time warp where astronaut Stevenson may find the answer to all creation. What did you think of astronaut Stevenson and the launching of Prometheus 5, bud? Well, I thought he did uh, just fine, Walter, and this launch certainly uh, couldn't be called a lemon. No, sir, it's no lemon. Really having a great time, aren't they? They're really pleased. They deserve it, too. Really pleased. <laughs> <laughs> They're really pleased. They deserve it. <laughs> we could stand some of that bubbly ourselves, bud. <laughs> so. We're doing a seven o'clock show tonight. <laughs> They're really pleased.
<laughs> We've got him. All indicators point favorably. Respiration, heartbeat, blood pressure. Oxygen, water, cabin pressure. All indicate A-OK. -okay. Well, then I'm not dead. No, no, you're just fine, you're just fine. <laughs> uh, we do get an excess moisture reading from the upper module of your spacesuit. Yeah, me too. Do you have a simple explanation? Yeah. Well, could we have it, please? I think I threw up. <laughs> uh, uh, hey, hey, don't doggone it. We've lost him. Hey, um, um... We have 120 million miles to travel, and according to the latest calculations, you should reach the Chronosynclastic Infundibulum in three months, four days, 13 hours, three minutes, and uh, seven seconds. Tony? Ma? Is that you? Oh, it's good to hear a familiar voice, Ma. You're a very brave voice, Tony. I'm very proud of you. And so is your Aunt Alice and Cousin Bruce. Mrs. Myers from next door says you come to dinner when you come back from your trip. <laughs> That's real nice of her, Mom. I see Mom Stevenson is still in mission control, bud. That's right, Walter. She's moved right in. Her mother standing by her son in his moment of need. She's moved a, a cot in there back of the retro readouts, and she's put doilies on the backs of all of the chairs. A marvelous woman, bud. Tell us if you plan to write any more poetry. Well, yeah, my first one's going to be a sestina, I hope. A sestina? Uh, well, uh, all I know about poetry is Burma Shade. Well, a sestina has six stanzas with six lines each, and the same six words and each stanza, you see, but in a different order each time. Uh, the six words I've chosen are taken from man's words when he, uh, Set foot on the moon. One long step for man. Kind. <laughs> the order of the uh, end words in the second stanza will be long, one, man, kind, step four. And then the third stanza is going to be step, kind, man. This is Walter Gesundheit. And Bud Williams, Jr. Bringing you the continuing saga of Prometheus High. Private Stoney Stevenson is approaching the core of the time warp at a speed of 28. I've lost it. I've lost it. It is now six months since Stoney Stevenson blasted off on his epic adventure. Communications have become increasingly hard the further he travels away from Earth. As the moment has arrived by all our calculations when Stoney will hit the Kronos and Plastic Infundibulum.
I guess uh, nobody knows now uh, when we'll see Corporal Stevenson again. No, if ever. Am I dead yet? I understand that Stoney is writing a poem out there in space, by the way. Really? Yes, and he's chosen those immortal words first spoken by man when he stepped on the moon. Oh, those, those words are very patriotic, Walter. A long step for man. No, I think it was a giant step for man, a, a long leap for mankind. Yeah. Hello, Control. Am I dead yet? It was it one, one long step for mankind? No, it was... Uh, it was it was one step onto the moon for a man. Moon wasn't in there, Walter. Not yeah. a, not in that. Uh... One uh, step, wasn't it? A man and two steps for mankind. One step for man and two steps for mankind. Doesn't sound right, does it? It doesn't flow the way it did originally. I'm stepping now for man. Now hoping I, that I think you have it now. All mankind will remember this moment in history. Did he say two steps at all? Or is it always well, like it's a step? one step for for man and one leap for mankind. I'm... Anybody? Welcome to the island of San Lorenzo. Does that make you happy or sad? That depends, I suppose. A wise answer. We fished you from the sea. Are you all right? I think so. Good. I am Baconan, author of the books of Baconan. These are some of my pupils. My name's Stevenson. You can call me Stoney. I am very interested to meet you. I suspect that we may belong to the same Karas. You see, I myself was washed ashore on this island 47 years ago. It was the major vindit of my Zama Kibo. I see you are not a Bakonanist. Come, I will teach you. These people, these children of mine, are practicing Bokamaru, a gentle form of lovemaking. Non-violent lovemaking. Be happy, my children. Bakonan is watching over you. We Bakonanists believe that all humanity is organized into teams. Teams that do God's will without ever discovering what they are doing. Such a team is called a karas. You are here doing God's will, not knowing why you are doing it. You and I are members of the same team. The same caress. Welcome to the theme. Thank you. When I was washed ashore on this island, I found a people almost crushed by poverty and a political repression of their life. Now, I have given them a religion of harmless lies, and you can see how happy they are. How can a useful religion be founded on lies. 
When the truth of your life is too terrible, that truth becomes your enemy. All right, my children, I think we're safe for the moment. Excuse me, Mr. Bocard, uh, but what did you do? Why is your religion outlawed? It was my own idea. Oh. I thought it would give the religious life of the people more zest, more tang. It did in the beginning. And then? The president was my friend. He agreed to play along. It was like a game, really. We agreed that the penalty for practicing the religion would be death on the hook. Oh, oh. No one was supposed to be killed. It was all threats and rumors. And then the president and I we drifted apart. Were we very close? He was my best friend. We had made a play, a work of art, of our life on the island. He would play the cruel tyrant in the city. I would play the holy gentleman in the forest. It was an innocent make-believe to distract the people from their miserable existences. Everything was fine until... You know, until people started really being executed? Yes. I suppose that it goes to show that you must be very careful about what you pretend to be. Because one day you may wake up to find that's what you are. Disappeared. Uh -oh. Yes, but I think he stayed as long as he could. One step for mankind, and they. It's funny, I. Wait, 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 wait. You know, I've been meaning to bring this up, Walter. The fact that uh, a while back I said that. Uh, my driveway reminded me of Mars. Yeah. I don't think I ever pointed out that my driveway back home is red. Well, that could be it then, right? A lot of people have been kidding me about that, and uh, I didn't point out that uh, it, it is red. Well, I wasn't kidding you. I know that, but uh, we think of Mars as red. Mars well, doesn't me, red. Uh, That's why I can Let me ask me. you one thing. Uh, was it a red driveway when you bought the house? Yes, or? it's been <laughs> red as, as long as I've known the, the place. <clears throat> came that way. Quite a few in that neighborhood of uh, red driveways, as a matter of fact. Isn't that an unusual color for a driveway? I don't mean to carp on the subject, but I why, did you, uh, why didn't you change it? I had no particular reason to uh, change it. It's, I don't think we need to. No, I don't think it's, 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 it's very important. State versus Dr. Paul Proteus. Graduated after second industrial revolution, summa cum laude, engineering and management. Revolutionary gray shirt society is punishable by death. Last week, attempted destruction of machinery. National is productivity control computer. You have pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit sabotage, to fomenting a riot, and to crossing state lines unlawfully. You have seen some of the results crossing state lines unlawfully. Do you still deny you are guilty of armed insurrection and treason? Jury will please rise. Raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear 
in all causes between party and party, what shall be brought unto you. You will render true verdict according to the law and the evidence, so help you God. You may sit down. This use of force, you don't regard that as levying war against your country? As treason? The sovereignty of the country lies in its people, not in its technology. We are vigilantes, waging war on lawless technology in the name of the people. Who are you? anyway, a crackpot patriot or a power-hungry revolutionary. I only want what's best for my country. Ah, mm -hmm. uh -huh, truth. What's the whole truth? That is the truth! <laughs> quiet, quiet! I demand an audit of this machine. Will the court truth take this Excuse me, are you what's going on here? Uh, yeah. what, what is he yelling at him for? What did he do? <laughs> what century is this? Is this Earth? Is this Earth? Oh, you better ask somebody else. I miss a lot. Need new batteries. Oh, right. Oh, I'm sorry. They ask me if I'm in favor of capital punishment, but they don't ask if I hear or not. <laughs> Your Honor, what's this? Would you tell me the date, please? Where's your gown? Didn't anybody tell you to wear a necktie and a business suit when serving on jury duty? Uh, no. If you appear tomorrow dressed like this, I'll hold you in contempt of court. We have a man on trial for his life here, and you come dressed like a member of the lower classes. How would you like to be tried by a member of the lower classes? Oh, I'd hate it very much. Get a haircut. Oh, sir, won't you please tell me what date this is? Why would you want to interrupt the business of this court to ask a question like that? I thought it might be my birthday. Your birthday? Birthday? Oh, I love birthdays. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Quiet! 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 Happy birthday to you. Quiet! Happy birthday. Now let's get down to business. Lower the screen. Here is state's evidence item number 13. In this unbiased essay, you will see the fruits of our great society. This is the same society that the defendant wishes to destroy. This is the same society which is paying you for jury duty today. It is indeed a land of plenty. It's a good life, isn't it, John Average Man? But did you ever stop to think what makes it such a good life for you and your loved ones? Well, the answer's easy. It's modern technology and our industrial system. Those are pretty big words. What do they mean to me, an average guy? Well, John, perhaps I can show you. John, our automated industrial system has made you richer than Caesar, Napoleon, and Henry VIII put together. Remember, for all his gold and armies, Marco Polo could not have gotten one single transistor radio. Not to mention the insurance, health, and retirement benefits you get through your employer, John. I never looked at it that way. Gosh, it sort of makes you think, doesn't it? But that's not all, John. Under this system, our civilization has reached the dizziest heights of all time far beyond the wildest dreams of the past. Thirty-one point seven times as many television sets as all the rest of the world put together. Seventy-seven percent of the world's automobiles. Eighty-three percent of all the world's air conditioners. Eighty-five percent of its power lawnmowers. 96% of its helicopters, 98% of its snowmobiles, 99.9% of the world's generating capacity. Well, I hope the jury was paying attention to that.
excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, could I have a dime for a phone call, please? Uh, miss, excuse me, please. Uh, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'm an astronaut, and I have to call Mission Control. Yeah. You see, they thought of everything but a dime. Could you could you spare a dime for a man who's been shot to a chronosynclastic infundibulum? That is the saddest story I ever heard in my life. Oh. That is the saddest story I ever heard in my life. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks. Boy, oh boy, that is the saddest story I ever heard in my life. <laughs> that is the saddest story I ever heard. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, hello. Hello? Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, it's, uh, is a text there, please? Yeah, just a minute. A uh, hey, text. Text, it's for you. Text here. Hello. Who is this? It's just me, Stoney Stevenson. Stoney? Where the hell are you? Stoney. Uh, well, it's, uh, S-C-H-E-N-E-C-T. A D Y Oh, Schenectady. I'm Schenectady. <laughs> He's in Schenectady. Oh, my mother lives in Schenectady. Oh, really? Something's gone haywire. Look, look. He's totally out of our tracking mechanism. Listen, Private Stevenson. Uh, he's a corporal now. Oh, yeah, uh, Corporal Stevenson. This is an order. Everything on Earth is completely off limits. Get back into space. Sir, I, uh, I'm, uh, not in control of my own destiny. It's a miracle I can control my own bladder. What? Oh, listen, he's lost control. Does, does anybody here know how to get him back into outer space? Well, somebody better come up with a plan and soon. Stevenson, is there any way you can get the hell out of there and back into outer space? Well, sir, what happens, happens. I think that I'm traveling through my own nightmares and a few nice dreams too otherwise why would everybody i meet speak english why else would everything be so american when america is all i've ever known <laughs> oh, sir uh there is uh, something uh strange to report about schenectady i mean not that everything isn't strange about schenectady but it seemed to be uh, uh, summer a minute ago, and now everything's frosting up. I, uh, oh, there's another thing. Uh, I suddenly feel very sleepy, sir. I really don't understand this, Martin. How could he have gotten in here? I really don't know, Dr. Hanukkah. It's a total mystery. Mama? Are you sure he's an extra body? Checked and checked. They're all there. Truman Capote, Julius Rosa, Henry Kissinger. When his sword, bring him in. Let's we'll see if we can find out who he is. Yes, Mama? Nope. I'm not your mommy. All right, now, sit up. That's my baby. Boy, what phone service in Schenectady? Don't be afraid. This is the Honecker Laboratory of Immortality. Now, stand up. That's the boy. Now, we've got you thawed out. Want to keep you good and warm. Dr. Sarayan, please call us Section 308 in the Sperm Bank. Dr. Sarayan... The sperm bag, please. Oops, a daisy. Here we go. 
Doctor, you must do it. It's important. Damn it, Hanukki, you know more about freezing than any other human being in history. I want you to figure out some way to freeze battlefields so that American soldiers will never again have to fight in mud. Well, there's always winter, of course. A Russian winter is especially good. Why don't you declare war on persons who live in cold climates? Laplanders, Eskimos, Finns, what? You are now going into Dr. Honecker's laboratory. You mustn't be alarmed by what you see here. Dr. Honecker has helped good human beings who are about to die. He has preserved them until cures can be found for their diseases. He has frozen them into suspended animation. Listen, Doctor, if you can get a handle on this, I can get any amount of R&D money. We can set up a crash program tomorrow. What do you want? One million? Two million? <laughs> so easy to get money for killing. And all I can do is scrape up just two or three thousand to freeze the best minds in our time. Dr. Honecker is a wonderful man. He's very busy, but he wants to ask you a few questions. You're our mystery man, you know. Oh, okay, sure. It is easy to get money for defense. Damn right. Man is an infantry animal. There'll always be wars. And the winning side will be the one who kills the most people on the other side. And everybody likes to be on the winning side, right? Uh-huh. Right. Excuse me, Doctor. Here we are. Ah, yes. Who are you? The abominable snowman? Did you ever volunteer to be frozen here? Not that I know, huh? Did you ever make a deposit in our sperm bank? Well, if I did, it was a small one. What's that now? Oh, it's the girl pool. The girl pool? She's there in room, and then her nature sing, and then her nature sing, and then her nature sing. The girl pool of Building 3 wish you and yours a very Merry Christmas from Anne, Belinda, Joan, Glenda, uh, Suzanne, and uh, all the girls of the typing pool. Merry Christmas. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see Doctor, can we get back to the problem? Hmm. I've been thinking about it. Now, I suppose that there are many ways in which water could freeze. All ice forms, you see, around a nucleus, a seed, we call it. Now, suppose that there were one seed with a melting point of, say, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we would call that ice nine. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, shush! What's this got to do with my problem? You see, General, a melting point of 140 degrees makes anything below that as hard as a rock. I'm beginning to see the point. Precisely. Mud. Mine? The General wants to attack mud. It's the infantry's stickiest obstacle. Just picture the Marines in a quagmire, a godforsaken swamp, with their trucks and their tanks and their howitzers, a wallowing, sinking in a stinking miasma of ooze. What do they do? Use helicopters? Supposing one soldier had with him a tiny capsule containing a seed of Ice-9. Ice-9? And suppose that soldier throws that tiny seed into the nearest puddle. The puddle would freeze. And all the muck around the puddle. Freeze? And all the puddle in the frozen muck. They'd freeze. And all the pools in the frozen muck. They'd freeze. And all the streams in the frozen muck. They'd freeze. <laughs> you bet your bottom dollar they won't. <laughs> Hooray. And the Marines would rise from the swamp and march on. That's it. That's just what I need, Doctor. Oh, wait till the Pentagon hears about this. It'll be the biggest thing since air transport. <laughs> Merry Christmas, girls! Merry Christmas! <laughs> <laughs>
I'll let you know Monday how much I can finagle for the pilot studies. You know, Doctor, before we're through, I have a feeling that you're going to turn out to be another Einstein. There really isn't any Ice Nine, is there? Not yet. I mean, if the uh, streams were frozen in the swamp, what about the rivers the streams fed? They'd freeze too, but there's no such thing. And the oceans, the frozen rivers fed? They'd freeze. What are you after, young men? And the springs, feeding the frozen lakes and streams. And all the water underground, feeding the springs. It'd freeze. And the rain? When it fell, it would freeze. Freeze. Into little hard hobnails of ice nine. And that would be the end of the world. Damn it all, yes. You should have told him that. Bit of a lull here in information from outer space, uh, but right now, and I was thinking you as our resident expert might answer a few of the questions that have and sent in here division control from our viewers all over the country. Sure thing, we could, uh, prevail upon you for a few moments. This first one here is from little Susan, age 10, of Kenosha, Wisconsin. And she says, I love Stoney. He is cute. Does he have a girlfriend? Did you know that? Uh, no, I don't believe he does at the present time. From San Francisco, San Francisco. Uh, Mr. Uh, R.L. says, or asks, when does uh, Stoney... That appears to be incomplete. Did you have Shave, that? probably. Uh -huh. That's what he means. Uh, there's a time in the in the program once a day when uh, we shave, because there's, there's a time to eat our meals and so forth. Uh -huh. From uh, well, now tell me. Uh, so long as you were out in space yourself, did you have any favorite foods? Yes, dehydrated artichoke hearts were favorites with me. The uh, cream turkey, uh, that was very good too. Mm -hmm. And tang, of course. <laughs> Don't get smart, Buster. I can pull a trigger as well as anybody. Insist on your right to be equal. Under the 243rd, 244th, and 255th Amendments to our Constitution, it is the law of the land that nobody can be better looking than you are. Nobody can be smarter than you are. Come on, come on, nobody come on, can man. run faster than you can. How do you do? I am Diana Moon Glampers, your handicapper general. If you know of anyone who can do something better than you can, it is your duty to report that person to my office at once. We want to handicap him fast so he won't make you or anybody feel inferior ever again. Wherever you live, no matter what time of day or night, simply dial 1776. Tell the operator who it is that's making you feel like something the cat drug in. We'll cream him. We'll settle his hash. What? Get this guy some handicaps! Hey! Get your handicaps on! Oh, hey, you! Take this! Put it on and be quick about it! What, what is it? Oh, you're you're making a mistake. One for the yeah. books, you Come are. on, wise guy, into your handicaps! I got two 25 pounders in the front, Mike, and two 40 pounders in the back. That ought to slow you down, Mac. Uh, hey, meathead, what's your IQ? Oh, maybe 131. 131? Gee, you need a radio. Mike, you got a spare? Right. Get uh, it right away. Why do I need a radio? Well, it's only fair, ain't it? I mean, it stands to reason. 
You got more brains than most, so you need a radio so you don't take advantage of everybody. Put this on, quick! And you better get out of here. Here comes the director. And here. <laughs> Handicap radio will be subject to two years in prison or a fine of ten thousand dollars in compliance with Article 334J. Hate that superior intellect of yours. And settle it, Smash. Good day, sir. Hello, Mr. Director. And now, direct from Television City, we bring you Television City's Symphonette under the baton of Alfred Blue Jean, presenting Television City's own corps de ballet in a special performance of Musical Moments. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a, uh, we have a, we're interrupting this program because of a, uh, a special news bulletin which has, has just come in. Uh, ah. Ladies and gentlemen, the police have announced today the escape of Harry Hazer. Har Harrison Bergeron, age 23, who was being held on suspicion of conspiracy. Bergeron is a genius and an athlete and is considered very dangerous. <clears throat> so, uh, this is me once again and we... We had that story about Harrison Bergeron, and we've got to show you his picture. Here is a picture of Harrison Bergeron, ladies and gentlemen. That's Harrison Bergeron. He's considered very dangerous, so shoot first. That's all from the police. Good evening. <coughs> Yeah. 
attention. Uh, attention down there. Now, now this is this uh, this is the director speaking. Uh, uh, where, where I'm going to have to advise you that that what uh, what you're doing is is just against the law. Is what it is, and, and we're going to have to ask you to stop. And uh, we, uh, this again, the, the, we can't be responsible for for what what happens to you if if, if you get sick. Music. Look, uh, the, uh, TV shows they put on nowadays are downright indecent, decent, 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 decent.
always stone cold by the time the client takes his first bite. He's not interested in more than the first bite anyway. Appetite isn't a big problem over there. I take this over to uh, Howard, Mr. Lionel J. Howard. Lionel J. Howard. Don't worry about carrying disease. You're carrying food in the ethical suicide bomb. You could have bubonic plague and it wouldn't make any difference to the people over there. They'll all be dead in an hour anyway. But you are not smiling enough. One ought never let that smile fade when they're here. Wider. <laughs> Follow me. What are all the people doing outside? What kind of a question is that? They're living. Oh. Not any more crowded out there than it is any place else. You know any place that's any less crowded? Uh, no. <laughs> now, Mr. Howard is right in there. Now, you bring him his meal, and you listen very politely to whatever he has to say. <laughs> He's got a lot to say. Can do. Now, if he suddenly decides that he's ready to die, you agree with him strongly, ring the bell, and keep him in a suicidal frame of mind until I get there. Right. And smile. <laughs> Don't be shy. Come in. Come in. And wipe that idiotic grin off your face. It's part of your job. Smile, smile, smile. Think I don't know that? I brought you food. Well, put it on the table and sit down. You know, it's nice getting away from the crowd. A lot of people would like your job. They'd welcome the opportunity to get into a suicide parlor without dying yet getting away from the crowd. I'm lucky, I guess. Human beings are like droplets. Droplets? Little knobs in the raspberry. Those are droplets. Now human beings are jammed together like that. What took you so long? Oh, just the uh, general ineptitude and some character flaws. Another two minutes of waiting for you, and I'd have walked out of here. You would have uh, decided to go on living. You call what they're doing out there living? You don't call that living. There must be some other word. I've chosen cyanide. My wife wanted me to take the carbon monoxide. God knows why. What I said, cyanide's more masculine. You know, when they started the ethical suicide program, I wrote the President of the United States, and I said that veterans ought to have the option of being tied to a stake with full military honors and shot by a firing squad of United States Marines in dress blues. I got a form letter for an answer. Said he had passed it on to the VA. Probably in some bureaucrat's wastebasket, I expect. Difficult to remember, isn't it? A day without your ethical birth control pill. A day without that wonderful, numb feeling below your waist. A day without the protection oh, of the host of sex. Oh, the hostesses keep feeding those suicide commercials in here. They're loaded with lots of reasons to get the hell off Earth. A beautiful pill that almost kept our population in control. And a beautiful pill that helps us through the days until the day of complete bliss arrives. A bliss of blessed death. Just peace in your nearest ethical suicide parlor. Your favorite meal from Howard Johnson's. Served by our charming hostesses in a scrumptious suicide room where you and you alone can expire. Haven't you had enough? Why don't you call your local ethical suicide parlor today? It's the ethical way to go. Been listening to that government stuff for years. Never had any use for it before. You did say cyanide, didn't you, Mr. Howard? I've said a lot of things in this veil of tears. 
Somewhere in there, I must have said cyanide. It's time. Uh, could I see the suicide commercials again? Oh, Mr. Howard, you know those all by heart. Uh, you know, I once saw this experiment that the government run to test the effectiveness of the ethical birth control pill. They blindfolded a guy and then gave him the Gettysburg Address. And right in the middle of the recitation, they kicked him real hard right where it hurts. And he never missed a syllable. I get to ask one last question. You what? I get to ask one last question, and you've got to give me a truthful answer. That's the law. Now, I never heard of that law. Oh, Mr. Howard, you're making that up. I swear it's the law. Mm-hmm. A lot of them start making up new laws when it gets to be near the end. Why not, huh? Why not? Mr. Howard, shall we ask for the needle now? If you answer my question. All right. We'll make a bargain. You ask for the needle, and then I'll give you the needle, and then you ask me the question, and I'll just answer it the best I can. All right. The needle, please. There you are. Yes, sir. While he was reciting the Gettysburg Address, they, they kicked him right in the butt. Oh. He never would like to ask his question. Oh, that's all right. He'll wake up in about ten seconds. He can ask it then. I believe he wants to put the question to you. I'm afraid you won't have time to answer. What? What are people for? In the beginning, God created the earth, and he said, let there be mud, and there was mud. And God said, let us make living creatures out of mud, so the mud can see what we have done. And God created every living creature that now moveth. And one was man. Mud as man alone could speak. What is the purpose of all of this? Man asked politely. Everything must have a purpose, asked God. Certainly, said man. Then I leave it to you to think of one for all of this, said God. And he went away. ashamed about. Hold on, here we go. He wanted to. Today was going to be my birthday, but I got hit by an ice cream truck before I had my party. I'm dead now, and I'm in heaven. Oh, I'm not mad. The ice cream truck driver.
even though he was drunk when he hit me. He didn't hurt much. He wasn't even as bad as the sting of a bumblebee. I'm really happy up here. So much fun. I'm glad the driver was drunk. If he hadn't been, I might not have gotten to heaven for years and years and years. I would have had to go to high school first. And beauty college. I would have had to get married and have babies and everything. Everybody up here is happy. The animals and the dead soldiers and the people who went to the electric chair and everything. They're all glad for whatever sent them here. Nobody's mad. We're all too busy playing shuffleboard. So if you ever think of killing somebody, don't worry about it. Just go ahead and do it. Whoever you do it to should kiss you for doing it. The soldiers up here just love the shrapnel and the tanks and the bayonets and the dum-dums that let them play shuffleboard all the time and drink beer. <laughs> said before. Do you know who I am? Yep. And you scare the hell out of me. I think you scare me more than anything I've ever seen in my life. I am deaf. And I'm here to tell you all there is to know about me. I don't think so. You deny I am deaf. I think you're my childhood dream of the most terrible creature that ever could be. And I think this is my childhood dream of how God might try to make people happy when they're dead. I am deaf, and I am final. Oh, God damn, I ever final. When I say the magic word, all these people will vanish forever. Then I will say the magic word to you, and you will vanish, never to be seen again. There is no heaven. When you are dead, you are dead! And that's all there is to it! There is no afterlife in any way! Shake! Or fall! Go to the worms, you fool! The worms? To the worms! My blonde Teutonic child. Goodbye. Goodbye. And then there was one. Death in inner space. What is this? You know, it's all in here. You, this, them. Mission control, the sun, 
And the moon, the stars. I'm going to make you disappear. How? Up here. I'll just use up here. There is an afterlife. If I create one up here, I can be anything up here and destroy it. Life <laughs> against death. Death against the imagination. Disappear. Appear. Everything was beautiful. Nothing hurt. Oh, lucky me. Lucky mud. See what a nice job God has done. Nice going, God. I certainly couldn't have done it. I feel uh, very unimportant compared to you. The only way you can feel the least bit important is to think of all the mud that didn't even get to sit up and look around. Yeah, I got so much. Most mud got so little. Never was worthwhile. So, pack up your troubles in your old kid bag and smile, smile, smile. Hi. Hey. Uh, there's a, there's a tombstone back there. Tombstone? An understatement. That's what that is. It says on it, Stoney Stevenson, astronaut. Of course, he's not buried there, you know. No, that's just a memorial his uh, mother put up. He's out there in space. Or he's out there in time. Who knows where he is? Right. <laughs> you know, it says on the stone, everything was beautiful, but nothing hurt. I thought everybody knew that. I, I, I've been away. Uh, well, you see, his capsule landed in the Pacific, right on target. And when they opened it up, there was nothing there. It was just a note and a half-filled bottle of Tang. And the note said what's on the tombstone. Thank you.
light your way. Always. That's his time. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile. Back up your troubles. Your old kid back. <laughs> smile. Smile. Smile.